Derek. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Derek Soto, and I'm a researcher with CARICOS and University of Puerto Rico. And Jennifer. Did somebody say Jennifer? Sorry. Yeah, it's Jennifer okay. Dorton. Oh, hi. Sorry. It's Jennifer Dorton with uh, Sikora, and I was recently pulled into the MBON fold um, at a meeting last week, so I'm really looking forward to hearing Neil's presentation today. Thank you. Kate Stafford. Hi, I'm Kate Stafford with the University of Washington, and I've been part of the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observing Network with Katrin Eichen, and um, I'm responsible in this new round of funding for the ocean soundscape work. So I'm really exciting about really excited about ocean sound being an essential ocean variable now. Thanks. Great, uh, Kate. If I may also encourage you to join with Neil. So there, we're trying to do a, this cross Amborn effort, and Neil stepped up to do sounds animal tracking. So if you can connect, uh, after the call, that would be great. Certainly. Uh, Neil, I'll contact you via email. Great. I would love that, please. Kieran? Hi, I'm Kennedy, and Victoria, and I've been working on marine biodiversity and acoustic sounds in the system, so I thought I would join. Thanks, Kieran. Your sound is uh, not so good. Uh, hopefully, yeah. something happened with our sound. Yeah, sorry, that's not me. That's coming through somewhere else. Cause mine. Yeah. So somebody just joined. Who, I'm gonna mute everybody, and then as you unmute, uh, if you need to talk, please. Unmute. Sorry about that. That's not me. That came through somewhere else. Right, but I have muted everybody. So, uh, Marion, you will have to unmute yourself if you want to be heard. Okay. My name is Marion Stössel. I'm with GCUS at Texas A&M University in College Station, and I'm working into incorporating uh, uh, data into the obvious. Uh, format so that they can be put on to our ERDAP server, uh, also converting them into NetCDF files and then putting them on our uh, ERDAP server so that everybody can uh, access the data. Mm -hmm. I'm working with uh, Florida data and at the moment I'm working with the, cage, the CAGES data from Alabama, uh, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana and Tex Texas and Florida. Great. Mike Wise. Hi guys, this is Mike. Um, I am the Office of Naval Research uh, Program Manager for the Marine Mammals and Biology Program. The overarching question for that program is the effects of sound, primarily on marine mammals, um, although I'm the uh, Integrated Ocean Observing Committee rep for ONR. That's the interagency committee kind of overseeing the IUS program. Uh, also a uh, in this round of MBON, uh, a minor player, but a co-funder in the Arctic uh, MBON. Um, and also as part of the IOC is where we develop the animal telemetry network um, and been working for several years with Cross MBON and ATN looking to how we can complement or integrate those programs. So very interested in, in what Neil has brewing on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Mitchell Ryder. Okay, let's, let's jump to uh, uh, Neil. I'll, I'll introduce you, but you can say something about yourself. All right, hey all, uh, this is Neil Hammerschlag. I'm a uh, research associate professor at the University of Miami Rosenfield School. And my work is focused on uh, the behavioral ecology of, of marine predators under um, global change. And, you know, I got involved just recently in MBON, I was fortunate enough to, to work um, on the South Florida MBON, working with Frank and, and some other great individuals to try to 
um, explore the integration of animal tracking and also soundscapes into their biodiversity um, monitoring, and in particular, start thinking about ways to map multiple data sets uh, and integrate some of the, the other data sets that we're being um, that we're working with here in South Florida, and, and try to compare them with the tracking data and soundscape data to see how well they match and are correlated, and potentially work to based on that to try to um, maybe get some some efforts globally um, to be collecting data in ways that are um, are compatible for you maybe at some point some global comparison analyses throughout MBON. Thank you, Neil. Sandra? Kitty Hacker, working for the German Marine Research Consortium and coordinating um, the first steps of Atlantos. So there we try to initiate a use case about animal tracking. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Glad you're here. Tyler? Hi, uh, I'm Tyler Murray. I work under Frank at the Institute for Marine Remote Sensing here at the University of South Florida. I'm a systems and software engineer providing support to the Inbound project wherever I can. Great. Uh, thank you. We have had a couple other people join since then, Enrique. Okay. Uh, Deborah? And Isabel Sousa Pinto, if you can say who you are. Did you call Deborah? Yeah, can Deborah. I, you're there? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, just a Hello. brief introduction. How are you doing? Uh, Isabel Sousa Pinto from the University of Porto in Portugal, and I'm one of the uh, MBON co chairs with Frank and Mark. Costello and also very involved in the Atlantos program and I'm also interested in animal tracking although yeah that's it for the moment. Yeah thanks Isabel. Deborah? Uh, Deborah Hernandez I'm the executive director for Socora and um, we're funding some acoustic and tagging work in our region and interested in um, all the inbound work as well. Great thanks Deborah thanks for for coming. Oh, Enrique Montes, are you there? Okay, I think Enrique is, but may have problems with his microphone. Uh, today we have a, a, a really a, a treat. We have Neil Hammerschlag. Neil is at the University of Miami. Uh, he's a marine ecologist and uh, research professor at the University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, and he heads a shark research and conservation program. He joined our South Florida M Bond program. This is one of the programs funded under the National Ocean Partnership Program in the U.S. and funded through NASA, NOAA, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and the Navy uh, as, a, as a consortium of different projects around the country. Uh, there are six projects right now. We're also joining with the Smithsonian uh, uh, Marine Geo Program. And we also have an international link through the Geobond office. So uh, Neil is going to talk to us about what he's doing in South Florida, but the hope is that we can join uh, nationally with other MBON projects in the U.S. and develop a, a strategy jointly with uh, people on the international arena, like the project that was just mentioned, Atlantos and and Geobond for how we use animal telemetry, soundscapes, and other types of acoustics for uh, eventually looking at biodiversity in the ocean. So, uh, Neil, I'm going to let you take on, take the program. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you all. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to speak to you today, and um, hopefully, you'll find this this information uh, interesting. But um, you know, we're always looking for collaboration and also ideas to um, make this work relevant to as many people as possible and making sure the data is being collected in a way that allows for 
potentially cross-system comparison and monitoring over time. Um, so like Frank said, I um, mainly work on the behavioral ecology of marine predators, particularly sharks. And I've been, in my lab, we've, we've relied heavily on both satellite and acoustic tracking to ask some of the research questions that we're addressing. And um, we've also been doing, starting to get involved with soundscapes, uh, particularly to monitor anthropogenic noise, which I'm going to tell you a bit about that. And I've been tasked by Frank with trying to think about ways to, to use these tools and in thinking about biodiversity. And so with that, um, I, I want to chat to you about what I had in mind and maybe get your thoughts on that and talk about ways that we can collaborate and, um, you know, trying to, to implement this maybe nationally and globally. So, and I'll tell you what, what I had an idea. So let me first advance my slide. So one of the major challenges we face as trying to map out biodiversity in, in the ocean is the fact that we can't see through it. You know, it is so amazing that um, all this effort mapping biodiversity, but we, we as, you know, biologists and, and ecologists, we, we have this immense challenge is that we, we can't see through the ocean. You know, even on scuba, you know, we're so limited where we can go, the depth, the amount of time, close to shore, duration. Um, and this is, this is a massive challenge that we have to overcome, especially considering how in the ocean animals are, and the environment, the environmental conditions are so dynamic, are constantly in movement. And, you know, many um, species in, in, of, of marine animal are so mobile, which makes, you know, studying them so difficult. And I wanted to start off by talking about marine predators because I mentioned I study marine predators, but there was a recent paper that came out uh, by Elliot Hazen and company that were arguing that marine top predators are really great indicators for, uh, as for climate and ecosystem change. Therefore, they can act like canaries in the coal mine. And I thought about this and how it relates to biodiversity, and I think it, it and especially as it relates to the animal tracking side of things. And I think this is a really great thing to bring up because as top predators, you know, they're wide, they're mobile, uh, they move over large distances, but they're very sensitive to environmental change because they integrate information from, you know, the bottom of the food web all the way up. And being highly mobile, they can respond to those changes uh, relatively quickly also. So when conditions get unfavorable, uh, they can move on and look for different resources, different patches, different environmental conditions. And there's a growing number of, of work that is showing that they're very sensitive to, to climate change. And unlike some other animals that, you know, sessile animals that can't, you know, when environmental conditions get unfavorable, they can't move, you know, predators can, and they can move very large distances responding to gradients in physical conditions. Uh, through the food web, they obviously are integrating everything below them, and you know to have, in order to have a healthy predator, uh, high predator abundance and, and predator population, you often need um, a lot of prey and and a well functioning food web underneath. So they could act as good uh, monitors or sentinels for environmental change. But I say this because they're also being large in size. Um, they are pretty well. Uh, suited to carry uh, sensors and tags and equipment that you might be more difficult to put on smaller individuals. So marine predators also are available for our good species for tracking. And I'm going to first start talking about and thinking about tracking as it relates to biodiversity monitoring. And this is a picture uh, of a bull shark with a spot satellite tag on its fin. This tag um, when the shark comes to the surface, which they do at irregular intervals, this tag breaks the water surface and will send a message to an orbiting satellite. That satellite will um, make some calculations to estimate where the shark is, and we that data then becomes uh, downloadable. And you can actually follow in near real time where these animals are going. And there's been a huge application of this tool to monitor um, animal movement, 
to, to learn more about the bio, the behavior of these animals uh, and really understand where these animals are going. And we're starting to use other sensors to try to figure out why they're going there, but largely it's been used to map out the distributions, the home ranges, and environmental preferences of the, the focal species. And what I, and there's, this tool is becoming very popular and many people are using it. And I wanted to um, discuss, I wanted to, to present to you the types of data that's possible. And this right here, you're seeing an animation from a paper that was published this year in Nature that was a global analysis of shark tracking data. So this was, um, and why I mention this is because I think this is a great example of different groups of researchers coming together and tracking, providing tracking data to answer questions that you couldn't be answered in a single species study uh, or a single area study. So the question of this analysis uh, was to try to map distributions of, of um, sharks, look for areas where they co-occur. So look for co-occurring overlapping hotspots. So not only, you know, where most sites have tried to look for hotspots of species in a, a single area of a given single species, the goal of this was to um, look multiple species look at shared hotspots where there's an overlap in hotspots among different species at a global scale, and they compare these hotspots in place and time with uh, fisheries that in which sharks are either caught as target or as bycatch. So the result of this analysis was identifying first step is global shark hotspots. And so what you're looking at here is a heat map where red areas are areas that are shared hotspots among multiple species. And why I'm showing this is for a few things, but one is the idea of combining tracking data sets and able to look not at just single species hotspots, but multi-species overlapping hotspots that are, if you're thinking about biodiversity, are potentially areas that could be considered as uh, you know, for the species being tracking is a way of looking at biodiversity, you know, where you're looking, finding overlapping shared hotspots uh, as a measure of, of potentially biodiversity, at least some sort of measure of it. And what's also interesting about the, this is that, again, this was a, a collaborative effort where over 150 scientists from 40 institutions shared data. And I don't know, you know, maybe some of you aren't familiar with, uh, I know Michael is and, and Bill is and, and others, but as people who study uh, marine megafauna are not always the easiest people to work with when you're studying charismatic uh, species and not everyone, not everyone gets along with each other and, and sometimes it's very hard to get people to share data. But what was great about this is we got all these uh, scientists to actually share data, map data in order to, to generate these hotspot maps and then ultimately compare it with fishing. And so what we were able to map this onto uh, data from where uh, fishing occurs to calculate actually kind of the hotspot, shared hotspot overlap with fisheries. So again, why I put this on here is just to give an example of the power of, of this data, um, the idea of collaboration and, and being a lot, bringing different data sets together on tracking data to be able to identify, you know, these important questions and the idea of overlapping hotspots as a potential metric of, of biodiversity. And what's really great is we can then take these hotspots, for example, and compare it with other metrics of biodiversity or other monitoring that's going on to see how well they correlate and how well are, for example, these hotspots mapped on to um, you know, prey hotspots or, in, you know, environmental biodiversity and, and other metrics of biodiversity that's being collected as part of MBOS. A limitation of this data, though, to consider is that you really only have information from where you're tracking the animals. And a lot of times this, in, this information can be, um, can be biased on where you're tagging, the, when you're tagging, and so you know, just because you, uh, there's 
um, there might be a um, an area where there's no data it doesn't necessarily see, mean that an animal wouldn't go there and it just might be because no one's tagging in that area uh, or the duration of the tagging or of tracking um, didn't cover that that area or time so that's a big limitation of the data set and especially again how it's really reliant on how many individuals you've tagged when you're tagging and where you're tagging and and, and, and limits the scale and inference so to try to over, overcome that issue I've been thinking about ways where um, we could get better coverage in space and time to think about where these animals are going to or where these animals use space or areas that are important to these animals and how that might be used potentially as a tool to consider in our biodiversity monitoring. And I wanted to share, um, I think I had an idea for, uh, I think, uh, a way to overcome this challenge and think about identifying potential overlapping species hot, uh, hot spots that don't necessarily rely on complete spatial and temporal coverage of tracking data. And the idea is to use um, uh, habitat modeling or looking at habitat suitability modeling. And what you're actually looking at here are the results of habitat suitability, habitat suitability modeling uh, that uh, my lab had done, led by my student Hannah Kalich, in which we looked to try to identify within the Gulf of Mexico and along the U.S. eastern seaboard areas that were suitable habitat where you'd have the high probability of predicting a specific species based on the environmental conditions that occur there. So we tracked great hammerhead sharks and tiger sharks with satellite tags and uh, we compared what we did is we looked at the movement data and ran it in a habitat suitability modeling tool looking at the environmental conditions in which these animals occur to predict in order to kind of predict within the a geographic range what areas would be most highly suitable and to give a kind of a better idea of what this modeling exercise actually does is with what happens is when you are tracking the individuals you ultimately get you know points on a map where these animals are going so what this modeling does is it takes the suite of environmental conditions over which these animals are are, are occurring and looks to see which environmental variables co-vary with the positions of where uh, of tracked animals and looking to see how those environmental conditions, both individually and together, predict the probability of occurrence of those tracking points. So basically, you figure out the kind of the recipe of the environmental conditions for which there's a high probability of that animal occurring based on the tracking data um, where there's co occurrence between the tracking data and the, the environmental condition. And then what happens, the model then looks to whatever spatial domain um, within the area of interest, and it looks to see where those suite of environmental conditions occur, that recipe of environmental conditions in which probability of occurrence is higher or is highest. So it creates a, a probability map or a distribution map, which is represented here by, by colors where the warmer colors are areas where there's a higher probability of occurrence based on, on the suite of environmental conditions that occur there. And so the model will help you show which of the environmental conditions are most impor important in predicting the animal's presence and also, um, you know, where those suite of environmental can occur. And what we've done here in this, um, in this map is we've compared uh, great hammerhead in both the warm season and also in the cold season, so different parts of the year. And you see what you're looking at is a map where red areas are areas where you have a high probability of occurrence. And then what we've done is subsequently um, map co-occurring areas of high probability of occurrence 
by season for both species. So where do both species occur? And in high, so where is high suitable habitat? And then what we did is, so shared suitable habitat that is highly suitable, we, we found those areas where both of these highly suitable habitats overlap, and then compared that to areas that are uh, protected from, um, that are, are currently within or outside of um, place-based management. So like time area closures or marine protected areas. So what you're looking at in this figure above is here's a map of the study area in the southeast region of the United States. The cross-hatched areas are areas that restrict pelagic longline fishing, which these sharks are taken as bycatch. And the areas in blue are looking at um, um, highly suitable habitat that is co that, that co-occurring highly suitable habitat for both species that is protected. Um, what you see below is co-occurring highly suitable habitat that's protected in blue, but that's vulnerable, that is unprotected by um, bottom longline gear that targets these species. So bottom, bottom longline gear targets these species, and you can see areas that are red or air shared, kind of hot spots of high probability of occurrence that are exposed to, um, that are unprotected from longline gear fishing. And so, what I propose is potentially a way to move forward in some of this analysis and ways to try to integrate some of the animal tracking data, at least the satellite data, is to use habitat suitability modeling of a variety of different species and identify areas that are overlapping highly suitable ha habitat and looking to see the percentage of that which is protected within, for example, a national marine sanctuary. And basically, the idea is this could serve as a tool to help come up with indicators for whatever the uh, a management um, agency in charge of, you know, conserving or uh, managing a particular area. Because you can start asking questions that, you know, over time, how how is, um, you know, how is the boundaries of that managed area? How is it, uh, how is the amount of, you know, habitat suitability or hotspots of habitat suitability, um, is there a change in how much of it is staying within you know, the boundaries of different management zones as it relates to different environmental conditions, which could be natural or anthropogenic? And are we seeing species highly suitable habitat changing in response to these natural or anthropogenic conditions and what are the implications for you know these hot spots within different management zones um, why i like this approach is because it's not um, it, while it has its caveats like anything else it's not limited on having to have full coverage in space and time of of tracking data because the basically the study area, what you're looking at, the habitat suitability models are trained on, on um, areas where you have data and projects it to areas that you don't have data. Now you can't take, you know, you wouldn't want to look at create habitat suitability models or create the model based on, on data in South Florida and try to project it to another part of the world. It has to be within the same region. Usually, with and in, in, in best if it's within the same distribution of that animal itself. But because I know these species can move, you know, are connected, their di distribution and range is Gulf of Mexico along the U.S. eastern seaboard. I can take information on, you know, in, in different parts of um, this study area and use to develop the model and then project to the same area. Um, but it makes it less data reliant or less. Uh, data reliant on having a complete spatial and temporal tracking coverage. And that's the benefit I like about using this approach. And like I said, you can start now identifying areas that where you have overlapping highly suitable habitat for different species. You can compare by life stage. Uh, you can compare by taxonomic group. Uh, and then you can start asking questions about you know, the overlap with management zones and how changes in the environmental conditions uh, might influence that. 
So for example, Embon has this great Seascapes product looking at Seascape biodiversity, and we can start asking how Seascape biodiversity influence probability of occurrence of different species that are being tracked, and, and ultimately how changes in those Seascape uh, metrics and indicators might influence habitat suitability, and therefore the amount of habitat, um, suitable habitat that is, for example, within different management zones or predicted in management zones. The next thing I just wanted to chat about is acoustic tracking. Um, and this is another type of tracking tool that I'm thinking of, that we're trying to integrate. Um, and this is where um, it's, a, it's slightly different satellite tracking data because transmitters are inserted in the animal and you can see different transmitters have different in battery life and what sensors you can put on them. But basically they're the size of about a AA battery. You can see in the top left image. Uh, they're often surgically implanted in an animal right into the, the body cavity, sewed up, and some of these tags can last between five to 10 years. And the animal swims around, and basically the animal's distribution or presence and absence is monitored by underwater, essentially listening stations. They're hydrophones that listen for the frequency that is emitted by the tag. So the tag is actually emitting sound energy. Um, they're sending, um, these tags, for example, are transmitting at 69 kilohertz, and these receivers are essentially listening for those th that signal, which is essentially uh, sends a tag number in, and the receiver will um, essentially it's, it's sending this acoustic uh, sound that's got the tag number encoded in it. The receiver or listening station will log that transmitter number or logs the date and time and transmitter number and if there's any other sensors on the transmitter and then the that receiver data has to be downloaded now the strength of this is that pretty much if an animal is within the detection range of that underwater uh, receiver or listening station you know there's a good chance that it will get detected um, the problem is that this data doesn't allow you to follow the animal like satellite tracking. It really tells you about presence absence. You know, if the animal is there, ideally it logs the animal there and you can look at things like how often it's present. present. But these are generally set up um, with specific questions in mind. And, and the design of where you put your acoustic receivers, which are termed when you have multiple acoustic receivers are out, it's termed an array. Your array design is really based on the question you're, you're trying to ask. And in doing so, you know, this data can have, has its strengths and, and limitations in that you can't really, when the animal's not in the detection range of the receiver, you can't really say anything about it. And so it's really good for presence absence data. But one of the strengths of this tool is that any animal tagged with an acoustic tag essentially can be detected on any acoustic receiver that is listening for that signal. And as a result, within certainly on the US Eastern Seaboard and now in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, uh, there are several hundred uh, receivers that are deployed, you know, nearly a, a thousand or so. And they're organized into networks where data is um, shared. And so, for example, if a shark eye tag off of Miami, is detected in the Florida Keys, um, we have a mechanism in place, networks in place where that data is shared. And so I'll know if my sharks are detected on other people's receivers or if someone else has, detect, has tagged, and people are tagging uh, teleos, bony fish, marine mammals, all different species. And especially this is great for species that are not large enough to carry a satellite tag or also don't come to the surface. And so the strength of this is collaborative networks, tagging small species uh, or species that, you know, don't come to the surface and sharing data in these networks. The limitation is you really only know presence and absence. But to the same degree, what I think is interesting is that a lot of the MBON monitoring are really fixed sites that are monitoring um, at a lot of fixed locations, environmental conditions or biological you know, the biological uh, factors at a given point in time. So it does provide a, an opportunity to maybe, if we are having 
if there are acoustic receivers that are at or could be set up at MBON monitoring sites, um, we could look at least over time how these and compare and contrast these snapshots. So for example, here in South Florida, at locate, try to find locations where there's eDNA sampling going on and acoustic tracking uh, or, or where there are acoustic receivers to maybe compare and contrast eDNA data with multi-species um, um, you know, hotspots or, or receivers and so, or environmental data or refish monitoring data. So again, snapshots in space and time that can be compared across maybe different data types. Um, all of these tracking tools would ultimately involve, you, there would need to be, in order to be successful, there would need to be collaborations built and data sharing agreements and that's a whole nother story, um, which is beyond this, but I wanted to just talk about, you know, kind of the different tools and the different tools that are available to potentially monitor multi-species use of areas and compare them to other types of MBON data being collected. And just to give you an idea, this is a map. This is, um, is an is a animation made by my student, uh, Mitchell Ryder, who's on the call. And basically, it's looking at several species of track shark, great hammerhead, uh, bull shark, and nurse shark. And we tagged them all off of Miami, but what you can see is their movements as, and where they're being detected on other arrays in the Florida Keys, up the coastline off of Port St. Lucie, and basically just how this, this type of a map would not have been possible without multi-species movements and habitat use, without the multiple investigators having receivers along the whole coastline and having these data sharing um, agreements and networks in place. And so that could be a very promising tool in the future to potentially compare, you know, with some of the, you know, having receivers at fixed sites where there is MBON monitoring to look at how presence, absence, and residency of multiple species might align with some of the other data that MBON is being collecting. Finally, I just uh, want to talk about soundscapes, and this is a really a uh, hot topic, and I think it's it's in marine biodiversity monitoring is certainly a, a newer idea that's being explored. Um, in my lab, we've predominantly been using hydrophones that we deploy in the water. We deploy these hydrophones that essentially are listening and monitoring and recording the ambient noise at very high resolution. And for my student, Mitchell Ryder, for his MS thesis, um, and he's on the call today, what he's been doing is um, off of Miami, we've been listening to the sound and then trying to determine uh, boat traffic as a measure of anthropogenic noise, for example. And off Miami, we have a big issue with, we have tremendous amount of boat traffic so we're trying to get an understanding of the scale of boat activity that is occurring in certain areas and whether we can see any correlations between boat activity and um, animal movements and animal habitat use. Not just sharks, but for example, in collaboration with Chris Sazo at NOAA, we're looking at how sea turtle habitat use might be influenced by boat traffic. So this is an example of, of the hydrophone data. On the left is what you know, kind of background uh, noise looks like over time with, um, with no boats present. And on the right, you can see uh, this, this plot of the frequency when, when there are uh, boats present. And there's various differences in signatures. And Mitchell, working with a group called Meridian out of Dalhousie, developed an algorithm that can screen our data and go through tremendous, tremendous, tremendous uh, amounts of sound data, ambient sound data, to actually map out or, or identify all the different um, occasions where there was a boat passing by. And this is important because it means we don't actually have to sit there and manually listen to uh, boat data. And to give you an idea, right now we're logging um, basically every 10 minutes, our loggers in the water, our hydrophones, are measuring continuously for one minute every 10 minutes. So when you have these things out for one month, two months, five months, six months, it's generating a tremendous amount of data. So this algorithm actually can help go through that data. It takes a few days, but can actually identify the different 
uh, it points where there's a boat passing over a specific hydrophone, and then we can look to see if there's any trends over time. And this is just an example for one of our sites, the types of data that's possible. On the x-axis is date. On the y-axis is our metro is boats per day. And you can see the, the peaks and troughs are highlighted by days of the week and color coded by days and week. The warmer colors are weekends. The um, more earthier colors are weekdays. And what you can see about, about this right away is that peaks in boat traffic tend to occur over the weekend and troughs in boat traffic occur to be occurred during the weekday. And that would be expected, right? So on weekends, people are off of work or going out on the boat and during the weekday, you know, they're in their office. And it's incredible that, you know, the algorithm and our data and the hydrophones are picking that up. What's also interesting is the, the range of boat activity that is occurring. It was just amazing to us, uh, you know, ranging between, you know, 150 to 350 boat passes per day is, um, is pretty amazing to us. I mean, just a huge amount of, you know, of boat activity in some of these areas. And this is right off of downtown Miami. This is a site right off downtown Miami. And not surprisingly, there is, you know, up to 350 boat passes. This is an area also nearby off of Miami, off of Key Biscayne. And this is a plot similar to the one you looked before. But what's really exciting about this plot is identifying uh, our certain points. So, for example, here we see there is a peak during a weekday. So here's a, you know, a Tuesday uh, where there's a uh, peak in boat traffic, 200 boats a day. So that's outside of the normal range. You know, sorry, Wednesday. What's going on here? Well, it turns out July 4th. So our, this algorithm and our, and our hydrophones can actually pick up the change in boat traffic that's associated with uh, the July 4th when people are actually a holiday. People are off that week. Um, if you look here, there's a couple points you know, Wednesday and Thursday during the week in this location, you know, July 24th and 25th or so. What's going on here? Why is there a peak, you know, Wednesday and Thursday during the week here? Well, this is lobster mini season. So this is the time of year where uh, pretty much their, the recreational fishery gets first dibs at lobsters and people go out in the water here off of Florida, run amok and it goes crazy. But amazingly, we're able to actually pick that up on the hydrophones where, you know, on a weekday, on a, on a Wednesday, we're getting 250 boat passes. This holiday is getting just as many as a weekend. And so we can look to see, for example, how the biological environment changes. And that brings up to the next way that people are starting to think about how to use this data. Besides looking at um, anthropogenic noise, we can start monitoring the soundscape, you know, not just for specific so not for specific sounds, like I mentioned, like boat traffic, but in general, how noisy in the environment, what does that say about uh, biodiversity? And this is work by a, a, a group of scientists that have started to actually use map soundscapes in the, um, in, the US, in, in, in the US, particularly in sanctuaries and parks. And so they've been developing um, tools and indicators of actually biodiversity based on the sound. So basically areas that have more biological noise, a higher richness in biological noise, are areas that potentially are uh, more biodiverse. And we can look to see how different areas vary in their biological noise versus and how that changes over time. And then we can map that, for example, on top of other types of data like the boat anthropogenic noise, like the boat data or animal tracking data or some of the other, you know, or, or the seascape data. You know, we're going to hear in the South Florida MBOM, we're going to try to map, for example, our, again, the seascape data and look to see how that compares to the soundscape data. Um, this is something new to our group. Um, my student, Mitchell Ryder, is going to be looking at measuring um, uh, soundscapes in terms of both anthropogenic and biological noise over time, potentially identifying key species that make sounds like groupers, snapping shrimp, lionfish, comparing that to eDNA, um, seeing what we can learn from that. And it certainly provides an interesting area for work. There are others that have, much, have been doing this for, for longer periods of time, although it's, again, still relatively new. And we're hoping to work with them and to learn their tools and techniques to make sure what we're doing is um, it could be compared and contrasted. 
Um, and so I definitely want to hear from anyone who are using uh, these tools and seeing how we can learn from them and, and how we can collaborate and you know, look for synergies. I think this is a very promising tool. Um, we're certainly excited about getting, delving in. I've been speaking to people involved in the Soundscape project. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to speak to uh, Lila Hatch, Layla Hatch and uh, Carrie Wall and some other individuals who have been already monitoring Soundscape in the sanctuary to get um, to provide our data to them and also integrate what they're doing into MBON and try to make sure that we are coming up using the same indicators and metrics for um, monitoring biodiversity over time and also how we can best you know, bring different data sets together to better inform one another. So can we bring what from other, like reef fish data and eDNA data and what we see there in terms of the species compositions and trends and how does that map out with, you know, acoustic data and sound data. Um, so I think that's a very interesting uh, avenue for the future and looking forward to learning more and collaborating with people. So taking all together, I'm going to just finish here and just say that we have some new tools in our scientific tool belt for monitoring marine biodiversity. Um, you know, we're still figuring out the best approaches. Um, we're more than welcome here in South Florida to hear what you guys are doing and how best we can work together, combine data sets, make our data completely, um, you know, uh, comparable to make sure we're using the same types of standardization and monitoring and and synergies, and I hope you know this can be something that we can compare across MBON groups, but um, that uh, we can potentially build on in the future. So, always looking for questions, comments, uh, and also collaborations. And you know, and thank you for for taking the time to listen. Neil, thank you. That was great. Um, anybody have any questions? Neil, this is uh, this is Bill Woodward. Just a real quick one that, that that's exciting, and Megan filled me in on the things you talked about last week, uh, too. So I, I really like the way this is going. One of the questions that comes to my mind, and I assume you're you're considering this too, is that in the habitat um, suitability modeling process, there there are there will be variations, certainly seasonal variations, and does that does that complexify things, or could it complexify things so much that these habitat hotspots might be moving around quite frequently, or or not? Just a thought that came to my mind. Yeah, that's a great question, Bill. I think it it one it depends on scale. So the thing is, you know, I think you got to use multiple. You know, there's no there's no silver bullet, and I think you know I I put that you know I have this tool belt here because I really think you know in order to build a house you can't just use a hammer, and I think people look at things like animal tracking or soundscapes or eDNA as all like a new shiny tool, and like you know if all you have is a you know hammer everything looks like a nail. So the first thing I would say is I think combining data sets, combining approaches, um, you know multiple approaches will provide additional resolution. You know, we, you know, luckily there's amazing remote sensing data and environmental data that is being collected through MBON that we can look to see how the environment's changing over time and look to see for which animals that we do have tracking data, it, how that's changing over time. So the answer is you definitely would like to try, you know, restrict your inferences to the same region and certainly it's better to, to map out habitat suitability by um, not only by region, but also by season. Um, and, you know, increase, you know, it's, you know, um, whatever you, the quality of data you put into your model is going to be the quality of data you get out of the model. So I think it depends on what scale you're looking at. So I think if you're going to, you know, look at the Florida Keys National Spring Sanctuary, a smaller scale area and asking very specific questions, I think uh, you, you're going to want to have as high resolution data as possible and certainly you'd want to make sure you're check, you know, looking at seasonal patterns. If you're looking at nationwide and a larger, uh, coarser scale, you might be asking for questions about on an annual scale, you know, because there's um, how are, you know, the average environmental, the average of the environmental conditions affecting kind of like, you know, more coarser scale 
um, hotspots. Right. Yeah. That, that that all makes sense. And I just wanted to hear your your thoughts on that. So thank you. That's great. Any other questions? And I hope you know those uh, um, you know uh, like Kate and Kieran and those who are working with with soundscape data you know or anyone working with the tracking data you know please reach out I'd love to get your your thoughts. Yes, I I don't know if uh, Sandra if you and and maybe Isabel if you're interested in uh, maybe saying what could be done in the international sense you're planning for. All Atlantic studies. Uh, there may be a, a really interesting opportunity to to join the European and other communities in in Africa. And uh, Neil actually works in South Africa quite a bit, so that may be an interesting connection to the All Atlantic study. So I, I don't know if you want to say anything at this point, but please uh, uh, engage in well, conversations. Well, no, uh, we there are already. So, are you at all uh, connected with this? Um, I mean, we have a European uh, tracking network, and there are other international tracking networks that so, uh, connect different. Uh, yeah, I mean, tracks um, from different countries, and of course, this European tracking network is mostly in the Atlantic. Um, are you going to say anything, uh, something, um, Sandra? Um, yeah, I wanted to add uh, just something because um, Gabrielle um, sent some more information today um, about what the focus of the use case uh, she's developing with uh, Fred Worski and some others. I think Bill uh, was in this conversation involved as well. Um, so they try to uh, yeah or made a case about integrating animal tracking with biodiversity and environmental information to predict and explain animal movement um, and the focus should be on salmon so probably start within the north atlantic basin but probably widen it to the south atlantic ocean for uh, mullets um, yeah, so I, I think it would perfectly fit to what Neil said in the beginning. So, and then for sure, um, making the connections to ETN, OTN, ATN. Great. We're going to run out of time here very soon. Uh, I want to close the call in about three minutes, but there are other news. Uh, so unless there are any, any other questions, we can quickly go to another topic. Just a quick question. Um, you mentioned the Marine Geo Program, uh, and obviously that poses quite a uh, large potential because of the number of study sites. Could you add a quick note on maybe what are the conversations that are happening there? Well, the marine geo, we're working primarily and focusing on biodiversity of seagrasses at the moment. We have a, a workshop that we're planning in uh, Santa Marta in Colombia jointly with the Embon Pole to Pole Americas group. Uh, Enrique can say something very quickly and maybe at that point we can close the call. But uh, Enrique, do you have any news? No, we're in the process of organizing that workshop. It's going to happen between uh, in the week, the first week of May at the Invermar, the Marine Science Institute in, in Santa Marta, Colombia. And this is going to be our joint workshop between the Embon Pole to Pole program and Marine Geo, which has a new newly funded uh, project uh, underscore under the Scientific Committee for Ocean Research. They developed a working group dedicated to seagrasses and basically they are uh, aspiring to organize the global community that is monitoring seagrasses around the world to use, you know, some pretty much the same kind of approach that Embon is using, is, is that is choosing standardized field methods and data sharing uh, workflows and protocols and so on. So we're going to work together because there is a lot of over, overlap between these two programs and 
that will happen in Colombia. Yeah, so uh, as, you, as you suggest, there may be many, many uh, places to link from eDNA, remote sensing, animal tracking. And so that's what we're trying to help people so that we don't duplicate too much, just trying to understand who's doing what with what, what methods and trying to link with best practices. So definitely a conversation with Emmett and, and his group is very broad, not just on seagrasses, but across a number of. So anybody that's interested in these conversations, send uh, an email or join the uh, MBON list server through the GeoBond members area and and join the conversation we we want everybody involved great well we're at the end the other the other thing that i wanted to mention is that uh nature serve uh, teaming up with enrique representing embon uh and with his experience on the pole to pole efforts across the americas but we would like to expand that to other continents of course is they have put in a, or they are planning to put in a proposal for the GeoBon Secretariat. And the hope there is that this will have regional re representation if approved, that includes other areas around the world. But uh, uh, we will see. That's a, a hopeful thing for how we better network uh, across a number of areas, including terrestrial and airborne organisms and in the marine world uh, all together, not just the marine or just the terrestrial. So with that, uh, I'm going to close the call and I thank everybody for participating. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Neil. That was great. Thank you, Neil. That thank you. Good. Yep. Really appreciate that. Thank you. And so talk to you. Yep. See you, Isabel. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.